Um, hi, everybody. My name is Andy Saldana. I am the executive director of New York Tech Alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, that works to connect the tech ecosystem here in New York City. Uh, we're most known for our uh, monthly event, the New York Tech Meetup, um, and, as well as a number of uh, events supporting the entrepreneurial um, and the technology community here in New York City. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us during this time um, virtually. Uh, for the Ask the VCs panel, uh, today's panel. Um, we are working hard to uh, transfer a lot of our programming online uh, currently and uh, making sure that the topics that we put in front of you are relevant for um, the business needs that you have today. Um, we have a fantastic panel organized for you today. Um, I will be turning it over to Paul Ellis in just a few minutes um, to moderate and host that panel. We've assembled a great panel of VCs um, uh, so get your questions ready. We're going to start with a few topics, but before we begin, just a few quick words and thank yous uh, that I would like uh, to say from uh, the Alliance. First up, um, thank you so much to our annual partners that make uh, possible the work that we do. Um, everybody from Xander and CUNY uh, to Paul Ellis's Law Group and Grasshopper Bank, um, they all do uh, such a fantastic job of supporting the tech ecosystem here in New York um, and allow us again to do the work that we do. Um, there's a couple of ways uh, during this time. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, so we're, again, we're working hard to keep our resources available um, and continue to create uh, amazing programming uh, virtually and um, as soon as we're able to uh, in the live, uh, live events realm. Um, but until then, virtually, um, and uh, our operating expenses, of course, continue while um, our funding expenses, as many of you are experiencing, are, are seeing a, a slow. Um, there are different ways that individuals and companies can support New York Tech Alliance. These are a few ways. Uh, one, through making a, a donation when you register RSVP for any of our virtual events, um, become a supporting or corporate member of New York Tech Alliance. We just uh, launched a new website. And we're um, experimenting with different membership levels, um, and we're excited to get that feedback from the community. So that's the second way. And then the third way is to make a simple, uh, small donation through our website. Um, I've listed the link there, um, nytech.org slash support underscore NYTA. Um, if you're able to, we understand that this is a hard time. So again, only if you're able, please, uh, we encourage you to support the organization. Um, we've been working on a number of events uh, to offer up to the community uh, next or in two weeks, Tuesday, April 14th, um, will be our first translation of the new virtual New York Tech meetup. Um, it will follow very much the same uh, uh, agenda that we normally have, show and tell of tech amazing technology from a few uh, startups and technologists in the New York City area with Q&A followed by a networking session. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, we're working on uh, putting together a great lineup for that. Um, Thursday, April the 16th uh, will be uh, the next event in our Foundations of Entrepreneurship series, um, focusing on um, financials and uh, what your what your company needs to know um, during this time. So we're getting is how do we extend our cash flow? Um, uh, what are best? What are the best? Uh, what are the tax implications of the, the CARES Act? So some of those are. The topics that we'll be discussing during that session. Um, that's in partnership with the CEO's right hand. And then we are working on a founder series with Crosshopper Bank. Um, we started last week, uh, our first virtual, virtual event, and that will be in a cadence of hopefully every two weeks um, with them. Again, discussing uh, creating a safe space for founders and CEOs to, to discuss the biggest issues and areas that they're encountering during this time. Um, you can always find our events at nytech.org slash our events. Um, again, we've put together an amazing panel today uh, from some of the le leading uh, VC firms here in New York City. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Paul uh, now to host uh, the rest of the event. Thank you so much. Andy, thanks very much. Again, my name is Paul Ellis. I'm a board member with Tech Alliance. I also uh, moderate and organize uh, the legal events uh, for the organization. Uh, I think it would be appropriate amidst this health crisis. Let's just take a moment before we start to uh, extend our thoughts and prayers to those who are ill today, to the families and friends of those who passed away, and uh, an expression of thanks and support for all of our healthcare workers and other workers that are on the front lines helping to keep us all healthy and safe. Um, so we're here today uh, amidst this health crisis. 
uh, to talk about a different crisis, an economic crisis, and particularly how that crisis is affecting the startup companies, the startup ecosystem, the opportunities for, for VC financing. I know that uh, even among my clients, I'm seeing some rounds that are going forward uh, unabated, but uh, you know, deals that have stopped. Uh, and obviously there are many people that were planning to go out into the market to raise money and they're really not sure what to do. And so today that's what we want, what we want to talk about. Even yesterday, I was looking at some pitch book data, noting that uh, valuations, there's you know, downward pressure on downward pressure on valuations. Uh, terms are starting to become more investor friendly, and that's sort of what we would expect to happen uh, over the coming uh, coming months. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to before we jump in, I'm going to make an apology in advance for any uh, technical glitches. Although I and Tech Alliance have done many, many uh, in-person events over the years. Uh, I think this is the first online event like this I've done. So uh, we're figuring it out a little bit as we go along, but uh, hopefully everything will go fine, but apologies if any, if any glitches. Uh, so as uh, Andy noted, we have a, a really great panel uh, that came together today. I really appreciate their involvement. We have John Elton, a partner at Graycroft Partners. We have Beth Ferreira, general partner at First Mark Capital and Rebecca Caden, Managing Partner with Union Square Ventures. Uh, so what we're gonna do is just briefly do introductions uh, and then uh, we will get into the content. Uh, so again, my name is Paul Ellis. I am the Managing Partner for Paul Ellis Law Group. We are an eight lawyer boutique firm in Midtown Manhattan. We do a lot of work with startups and early stage companies uh, in financing, venture capital, angel and friends and family, as well as mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and uh, operations uh, and uh, formation. Uh, John, would you like to go ahead? You're on mute. Uh, John, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Hopefully you won't have to say that again. Uh, so first off, I'd like to echo Paul's statement, uh, opening statement. There's uh, you know very serious situation happening with COVID. Um, and hope, wish everyone is uh, safe, families are safe, and uh, I appreciate everyone having me on here and, and taking time. I'm sure everyone's super busy. Um, so, uh, quick intro on me. I'm, I'm a partner at Graycroft. We're a venture fund based in New York and LA. I focus on uh, seed to growth investing, and uh, we focus on investing in and in partnering with uh, entrepreneurs who are looking at building big companies in internet and mobile enabled technology companies. Uh, Beth? Sure, hi everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Beth Ferreira. I'm a partner at First Mark Capital. We are a New York based fund um, investing uh, in the early stages, seed and A primarily um, across the consumer and enterprise landscapes. Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Rebecca Caden, partner at Union Square Ventures. Uh, we're a New York based thesis driven venture capital firm, primarily early stage, um, opportunistically a little bit later stage as well. Great, uh, thank you all again for joining. So let me briefly explain the format uh, of our event. Uh, those of you who uh, have attended uh, my in-line, my, my in-person panels know that we usually try to pack them full of content and we have an extensive PowerPoint and we sort of motor through. Uh, today, we wanted to make this more interactive to give people, make sure we have a chance to get to all of your questions or at least as many of them as we can. So we have, what I did, I went through all the online, the questions we got during registration from people. Uh, last night, uh, we broke them down into generally three topic areas, and uh, we've divided it up. You can see them on your screen now. Uh, so we're going to sort of divide up our discussion in three ways. First one, outlook for the VC market. Uh, what do the VCs uh, see happening in the coming months as far as valuation, deal terms, what type of businesses are going to get funded, and other factors. Uh, how are criteria changing? Uh, what are VCs looking for at this point in particular uh, before they make a funding decision? And finally, generally advice for founders, uh, and there are probably sort of two big areas. 
what can you all do at this point to increase the likelihood of your getting funded? And one of the biggest questions we had, uh, an obvious one is, how to stay afloat in the meantime? How do you reduce your burn rate? Uh, how do you extend your runway? So those are that's how we're going to break up the conversation. We're going to spend a few minutes uh, at the outset of each topic uh, to give the VCs a chance to give some general observations uh, on those topics, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, I have a, the questions that people ask during registration, and then we also have a chat box. Feel free to enter your questions. We'll get to as many of them as we can, but we have uh, over 150 registrants. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, we may not get to everyone. We'll do what we can. Uh, so a uh, first question, outlook for the VC market. Uh, what do we see happening uh, and, and how is it going to impact uh, uh, valuation deal terms uh, and the types of businesses? Uh, uh, any one of you, if you'd like to jump in on that. Beth, how about you? Sure. Um, so there's still a lot of capital out in the market, and you know deals are still going to get done. Um, we, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing new deals and looking at new deals. Um, that said, I think in the short term, you have a whole set of of firms that have you know very large portfolios focused on making sure that those companies have enough capital to weather. The storm. So whether that's you know 18 or 24 months of cash. Um, so there's a little bit of I'd say I don't want to say distraction, but a little bit distraction in the short term. But I think you know after the you know those four to six weeks, um, I think it will be it won't be business as, as it was, but business would continue. Um, and I'd say I think a bit less around pressure around valuations, but more uh, to a um a equal equilibrium level of um valuation so you know we're coming into a period where valuations were extraordinarily high and you know much higher than they were even five years ago so i think you might see a leveling out of those valuations and you know remember that vc business and making sure that incentives are aligned um and so those valuations well, you know, should be fair and um, making sure that everyone feels really good about building these companies going forward versus, you know, a view of them being potentially punitive. Because no one is, you know, we had to make sure that everyone, um, is excited and and is aligned to build the best businesses in our portfolio. Thanks. Uh, John, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, so I guess two things to highlight. If you look at past downturns, and, and I was at a startup and the first internet uh, bubble that uh, fell apart, uh, and then in 2008, I was launching a, a venture fund. And I, what I observed in that market, because venture is a little bit sticky, um, and I think Beth kind of referred to referred to this, but there's still uh, a number of companies that are at a certain valuation and there are still investors with money and there's still activity going on. Um, but what you start to see is, um, you know, where a company might get 10 term sheets, they'll get two or one now. And then, um, and then over time, what happens is the, is the bid ask spreads. So um, entrepreneurs and existing investors are trying to hold on to their existing pricing and and then the the new investors have a uh, lower price, and that that spreads. And then at, at some and, and deal volume uh, drops during that period. And I think that's what we're going to see over the next couple of months. And then there'll be a, a resetting, uh, likely in, uh, lower valuations going forward um, as that bid ask spread comes and it comes together, and, and people have to face the the new reality. Um, but, but fundamentally, um, we have uh, we're looking for new opportunities. Um, there's uh, some just realities of venture where um, outcomes correlate with founder ownership. So uh, we're we're very interested in keeping clean terms, working with people, trying to figure this out. The market's going to work itself out, um, and there's going to be some tough tough days ahead. 
but there is a horizon here. We will get through this and um, we're, we're focused with our portfolio on helping them first and foremost. And we're still looking for new opportunities. We, we've announced a, a couple recently um, that have, that have co closed over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I think that's the other point I wanted to make is there is a throughput issue in venture capital where venture capital is, is a relatively small industry. There's only a couple thousand people that work in venture capital that actually write checks. Um, and if you look at, in, in, and there's even kind of finer points within that. And when everyone is focused on working with their portfolio companies and making sure that they survive, they have less time. And I certainly can uh, have that going on now to look at new opportunities. And I think there's going to be just pressure on on the throughput of the venture capital industry as we work through these times over over the next couple of months and whatnot. So even if companies, even if we're still looking for new opportunities, our the amount of time we can dedicate to that is going to decline. So Rebecca, I I don't have a ton to add. I agree with you know everything that was just said. You know I think we've been thinking about it as. I think there are two issues that are um, completely connected, but a little bit different ahead of us right now. One is the very, the near term, and we don't really know what that means, you know, COVID time when we're all in our homes and the economy is largely shut down and a bunch of people's markets have been completely taken out from under them. And we don't really know when we're getting them back and how to kind of deal with that. And that has a bunch of challenges. One is, as you know, Beth and John were talking about, we're very focused on um, helping our portfolio companies and and working with them, and that's taking a huge amount of time. Um, the other is uh, we can't meet people in person, um, and so, you know signing up to be on a board for you know a decade without meeting someone in person. Um, I think we're all trying to stomach a little like what that means, and um, I think we'll get comfortable with it. You know we've been actively looking at stuff, but that's a big thing, and it will probably take a little bit longer to get comfort with that um, versus the pace at which things were going. There's general market uncertainty around, you know, what the economy will look like and what businesses will look like. And so what are right prices for things? Um, and then there's the longer term issue, which is what kind of economic period are we going into? You know, is it a recession? Is it a depression? Using our team very tremendously from people who think that the recovery is gonna be, you know, quite fast to those who think, we're entering a really long, um, unstable time. And so all of that uncertainty, I think at minimum, will slow things down. And so I think, you know, it, it's only right for, for VCs to set expectations that way. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, you've all, uh, were, there were some, some comments about valuation. Uh, what are other deal terms that you expect to see may you know, th there may be some pressure on beyond valuation. Uh, any of you? Well. Uh, so I think in the earlier, the earlier stages and, you know, and I can talk to, uh, to our firm, we, we like to keep our term sheets clean or our deals clean. Um, I think John had alluded to that, but we are seeing and, you know, speaking to some of my friends in the industry, some later stage deals that are sort of series C, D and beyond, you're starting to see very quick turnarounds for liquidation preferences and things like that from later private equity folks that are coming in that we might have not seen maybe 30 days ago. Yeah, we, we're seeing the same thing. Um, I, and I think that will persist the, the earlier stage stuff. Um, you know, the thing I say is complexity is the enemy of success in early stage investing. And if you're adding uh, uh, structure off market deal terms, those things persist throughout the rounds. And then it creates a, uh, you know, unaligned cap table where you're not aligned with the founder. And that's exactly opposite of what we want to be. So I think us and uh, Rebecca and Beth and, and partners at other great firms will continue to keep doing terms at early stage. But the later stage guys and and are, are going to have uh, and, and we see the same thing. They're going to they're going to start putting in bells and whistles and they're much more uh, kind of financial oriented investors. And, and we've seen that as well. And I think the, the liquidation changes will be kind of the first thing to go where you'll see participating preference. And then instead of a one X, you'll see a two X. And, and I think 
in, in fairness to them, uh, even though I hate those things and fight against them, uh, in fairness to them, when, when you're entering in huge uncertainty, that's a way for them to protect their downside. Yeah. It's also a way to, as companies are resistant on pricing, sort of the protecting and making sure that their valuations make sense in the long term. Got it, got it. Um, what uh, a, a, a crucial factor that, that people spoke about, asked about, was timing. And I know that, that you've touched on this a little bit. And certainly one of the things I'm hearing, and it's you know, to be expected, is that you all are sort of first and foremost focusing on your portfolio companies uh, and you know, making sure they're you know, positioned to survive. But as John, I think you noted, that puts pressure on your time. How long would you expect things are going to slow? And obviously, it depends to some extent on what happens with the economy and how long this, the health crisis uh, survives. But you know, a lot of the, the participants were asking, how long is it likely to be before you know, this sort of period of readjustment before uh, we reach a new normal, shall we say, things you know the deal volume starts to pick up again and activity start, starts to pick up to the extent you you can make any predictions yeah well my you know beth touched on this like or i think it's rebecca touched on it like nobody knows what's going on or when it's going to end and i think people who are trying to espouse those kinds of things um are just guessing at it and, and maybe some are better at guesses than others but they're still guesses uh, you know, my adage is predict often, remember selectively. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I hope it's short, um, but I, I, I can make I can make a strong case that it's going to take a while. I, I think the practical advice in this scenario is is what do you do? And my advice to the founders that I'm working with is assume a more draconian case. And, and the rationale on that is I think. In, in many scenarios, it's kind of a prisoner's dilemma, like it hurts more, it's more difficult to do. But um, in many scenarios, it'll outperform other tactics. If, if you're sort of putting the pain on pause and seeing how if this recovery happens quicker, um, you, know, you, you time that perfectly, you're gonna look brilliant. And, and there, are, there are gonna be companies that do that, hopefully. Um, but if it doesn't, those firms are going to um, vaporize and then you know, the people take kind of the middle path, like, let's take some pain, but let's just see how this comes. Um, and then if it picks back up, it'll do better. Again, you know, they, they might have the, the issue of cutting multiple times and, and you get into the death by a thousand cuts. Um, and then I think the more draconian route today, again, this has human implications and, and no, one, no one wants that. But we're in a difficult climate, and I think taking those uh, difficult choices early on and end up outperforming in a, a wide variety of, of cases. Um, now, that the further advice is very company specific. We have companies that are doing phenomenally well in this market. Uh, we have companies that are being affected, but not tremendously. And then we have companies that are virtually, you know, their revenue is kind of uh, virtually zero. Um, but that's sort of like my average advice across the companies I work with. I think that's a um, that is something that I'm finding challenging on giving advice for exactly what John said outside of our program, which is it's kind of this nuanced time where you know the attention economy has wildly shifted. Categories like online education and you know uh, digital health are absolutely booming and exploding because of you know necessity that's pushed behavior change in a direction and so you know um an early stage company there that's looking for financing you know may have a faster time in getting attention and engagement um not even in the next month i still don't think but in the next kind of several than companies that may have very good businesses but their markets are shut down right now um, that makes it really hard to raise money, and I would assume, you know, it longer than you think it would be just out of, you know, precaution. But I think one of the most challenging things about this whole thing is that there's no way we can know what the timeline is. We can't know, you know, that's what's frustrating from all of us stuck in our homes or anyone with kids and all of this, right? That there is no guess. We don't know. And venture plays very much the same where um, I think the recovery of the venture market is very tied towards the overall recovery of the economy. And so 
um, you know, we definitely press the businesses in our portfolio that are going to struggle as a result of this to, you know, take more drastic and um, sooner measures than you would think to kind of plan for the worst and hope for the best. Got it. So I, I came question. in, uh, why are many portfolio companies announcing layoffs already? Were lessons not learned in 2008? Do companies not have a rainy day fund from VC investments or any of them? I'll take this one. Um, you know, I, I would frame it more around, this is a time to think about survival um, and ultimately what it's gonna take to get through this period that we you know, all discuss, we have no idea how long it's gonna take and what is the downside case. So companies have you know, capital from either venture or other sources, but that's, that could potentially be a finite pool of capital. And so they're thinking about how do I make sure that this company can endure this period and ultimately last to be a long lasting company for the ages at some point. And so this period is, is um, a really tricky one. And when we, I think Rebecca and John both talked about the tough decisions that uh, laying off people because look, you're not gonna be able to do as much as you thought you were going to you obviously linked arm with with these people look them in the eye and we're going to build this thing together so it's a really hard thing for these companies to do but ultimately in order to get to the other side of this when you don't know um where you're going to get your next dollar or need to make sure that the dollars last and not just last for six months but you know more like 18 to 24 months to make sure to get to the other side so um you know, I think John had um, mentioned like making sure that cut is once. And so, you know, for what we like to see is that if we're gonna make it, we're gonna make some of these big swift changes, whether it's changing out vendors or layoffs, making sure that happens once and not multiple times over this period. Cause I think that's where you start to feel that um, acute pain. Got it. Um... All right, I think we're gonna move on to topic topic two, uh, which is how are VC investment criteria changing? Are there particular factors that have gained increased significance when VCs are deciding whether to extend an offer? Um, I would throw that out to any of the three of you to, to kick off. We invest in uh, oftentimes where, where one of the first checks there and um we really want to have a partnership with the founder where we're we're the first call and she wants to build a huge company with us and that's not going to change in uh in different markets um the, inv the investment bar is incredibly high for us as it is in any in, in any market um so i don't know that we certainly haven't at the partnership discussed changing our investment criteria. Um, and I think the, the thing that is different right now is um, in some companies, it's just incredibly obvious that they are going to be uh, impacted more significantly over the near to midterm uh, because of the, the current environment. And those, those types of companies are going to have more more difficulty raising capital um, and and it's you know consumer discretionary and stuff um, or that just is getting hit very hard right now um, so I don't think our, our investment criteria are changing um, but I think we're thinking harder about what some of the impacts of this will be yeah I, I think um, I don't think our investment criteria really changing at all. I think, you know, two things that that we're talking about are process and how to just focus. So on the process side, you know, we've been in an environment for several years where seed rounds can be raised on several meetings, you know, a couple of, you know, in-person conversations and checks are written and um, it go it can go pretty quickly, especially for competitive rounds. I think especially while everyone is remote, my instinct is that process and that it's going to take 
more time, more touch points, um, more kind of following lines versus individual dots to get checks written because people are adjusting to this new normal. Um, and there's kind of general economic anxiety. So I think you have to go into it knowing that you may be entering a, a longer process and think about how to build that relationship in different ways. And I don't think that's only kind of another Zoom call, but kind of bring people along on the story. I think from a focus perspective, which you know touches on what John said, I think you know if you're building a business around um, physical events, uh, physical retail, um, things that are heavily reliant on um, discretionary spend, you know, without knowing when an economy is going to recover, it is challenging for investors to make those early investments. And I think we have to be transparent about that. Um, and so, as a founder, I think I would think about the time that's spent and, and whether there's a way to make progress on the business right now without going out and trying to, you know, raise money, given the pressures on that environment. I, I'd like to that that's important observation you make Rebecca and I'd like to sort of open that up to the other 2, because that was a frequent question that people had. Uh, those sectors, which are. You know, going through tough times right now, what should they be doing? How do they approach you? Obviously, uh, you know, it's a much tougher investment call for you. What's your advice for founders in one of those industries uh, that has been particularly impacted uh, by the current situation? Dr. John? If you want to take that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think it's a really tricky time right now when um, your business is uh, either a halt or at a you know pretty pretty slow down to approach investors. I think you know that's when you think about sort of those dramatic changes in your business in order to to get to at least the other side where you can see some you know sort of pickup or um, glimmers of um, hope on the other side. Um, if that's not the case, um, you know, I think that understanding and being forthright with investors, I think we see a lot of businesses who are still in super sales mode and like, we, you know, we see businesses all the time and we see sort of kind of through some of that. Um, I like, here are the real challenges that we're having. Here's where we see the opportunity and be able to like connect the dots on that piece. Um, I think Rebecca. Um, talked about this is like how do you you know, build that relationship with the investor in other ways? I mean, we're going through a pretty tricky time right now. It's sort of adjusting as a partnership to a business which is primarily done in person, and that relationship, you know, being across the table to now all of a sudden, no one in the partnership is meeting these these um, entrepreneurs in person, and how do you you get comfortable with that? And that's going to take a little bit of time for us. And like, how is it's an opportunity to sort of figure out if there's other ways to, um, you know, build build that bridge, build that um, that relationship, whether it's you know through people um, that know the firm or know the investor that you're pitching, um, and and continue to focus on the things that are going to drive your business when we come out of this period. Yeah, um, I think you know similar to some of my earlier comments. Um, I, I don't think that has changed dramatically. Like it, it, what I like to say on two things. One is you have to have a plan for success. So if, if you're in a more difficult market, that's probably even more uh, important now. In 2008, for example, going into 2008, I, I had uh, seated uh, a friend of mine who was starting a uh, job marketing software. And, you know, in 2008, we sat down and talked about the, the road ahead. And problem there is because we'd funded before 2008 happened, we didn't have a plan for success and there were, there was no way that we were going to get through it. Um, so I think for, if, if you're coming in fresh in, in this environment into a new investor meeting and you say, Hey, listen, I'm building. Again, you know, taking take this as an example, a job marketing software, or something, i.e., something that's going to be 
a really tough road to hoe over the next 18 to 24 months in, in you know, without predicting the future, but understanding that in, in, in a high likelihood that's going to be an impacted sector. Um, that you have a plan for success that makes sense, that yields a, um, uh, a great outcome for the investors. But we're, we're all long-term investors. And I think the same things that you'd want to do in normal times, you, you have to do now. And, and I agree with Beth, it's a lot harder to do it over, over um, video conference and things like that. Um, and, I, and I don't envy people who are, who are doing that. Um, but making you know making a connection, going the extra mile to 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 do that. I I'm an investor in a robotics company. Um, you know we, we talked about having a like virtual setup of the of the robot that people can kind of go in and and have a video example of it because it's such a tactile uh, technology that like if you don't see it and understand it, um, it's hard to get excited about it. Um, so. So entrepreneurs are being really clever and smart about how they bridge the gap that that a uh, you know Zoom conference or or whatever can't can't do. Um, but I think the fundamental of like you know describing the magic of your business and why now and how this can be a huge company is is the same that same advice I'd give in good times and bad. Great, Th thank you for that. Th that's a good transition into our third topic area, which is sort of generally advice for founders. Uh, again, this was a, a, a lot of questions along this line. Um, uh, and to, you know, to some extent, we've already covered, we've covered some of this. Uh, what steps can founders be taking to better position themselves? Uh, and uh, a related question that came up a lot, advice for reducing cash burn and, and extending the runway. Um, if uh, any of you would like to, to pick those up. I mean, I think I would just start by saying looking at your entire cost structure and assuming everything is negotiable. Um, you know, we hear a lot about um, layoffs and rent, but there's a lot of other costs that are um, probably in your cost structure that you could think about negotiating or potentially pushing off a bit um, and be pretty prudent about it. I think you know, going into such uncertainty you don't know how long you need that cash to last. And the sooner you make those decisions and push push on those um, contracts, the, you know, the longer you'll have cash. John or Rebecca, or may, maybe the, this issue of the cash and the runway? Yeah, I mean, on, you know, on the cash, it's hard to give general advice on cash burn because it's very specific to the individual things that you're spending money on. But the broadest advice is to take a really hard look and to wait. I think, you know, one place to really think about it, depending on your product, this is why general advice on cash burn is really hard. It depends on what you're selling to who and what you're spending money on. So I, I find it a challenging one to generalize, but, you know, where you can cut, like cut uncomfortably, honestly. Um, and, you know, I, 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 what we've been telling founders is, you know, let the mistake be that you were too conservative, that you, you know, cut too deep and so you were too conservative and could have grown more. I think that's a, a better mistake to have made right now than, than the alternative. And that's a challenging mental switch to the last era, right? Because we're just coming out of an era where the strong focus was on kind of strong scale, grow as fast as you can, spend into that, you know, being too conservative was a real, you know, ding in that market. And I think the times have shifted relatively quickly, probably not for that long, not probably, forever, but I think if you can make that mental shift, it's probably a good thing, you know, to the other part of the question around um, what can you do? Um, you know, I think it's a good time to try to bring people along on the journey. Um, you know, we're all at home and everyone's reading emails and on their phones more than ever. So even if it's harder to get checks written right now, you know, start keeping people posted. Um, let them know about the wins. You know, that doesn't have to be a phone call every time, but just put them on that update and send out the updates and try to build those touch points so that um, even if the process is longer, you're top of mind when they can get there. I think it's a, a good time to be thinking about that. Um, I think that's all good advice. There was a question about what do you do for 
um, kind of sectors that are doing well. So I'll, I'll, I'll make some counterpoints, um, but, but I think I would say the same thing, uh, same things that um, Rebecca and Beth uh, shared on, on cutting costs. Um, so, so we had, so there was a mention on e-commerce delivery. Um, we were in uh, one of the uh, better outcomes in, in that sector, and, and we still have a number of companies in e-commerce and delivery specifically. And those companies are doing phenomenally well. Um, I just saw an announcement that Huawei, the Chinese company, uh, was uh, significantly increasing R and D, um, and Intel uh, uh, famously. Uh, Increases R and D in downturns. I do think the companies in a strong position that are investing in innovation and and thinking uh, longer term on this stuff are going to come out of this stuff even further ahead and even stronger. So I do think there are opportunities where in this tough economy, um, you know, the stronger companies that can do this. And obviously, if you're not in that, there, there's different advice. Um, but the, the stronger companies that have a strong balance sheet, that have a business that's doing well in this market. Um, you know, I, I have a number of companies in, in the automation field, machine learning and whatnot. And, and traditionally, that's that's been an area where uh, out of a downturn where people have been reduced, companies kind of have that uh, tough decision and, and have to more and, and do more with less. And so th those areas have done well through downturns. And, and the companies that I'm involved with in there, I'm encouraging to um, try and keep spending levels as, you know, in, in R&D and development and, and product higher, uh, even at the risk of, of you know, uh, reducing, uh, reducing runway and stuff like that. Uh, Beth or Rebecca, do you have any comments on that? The, the question was sectors that are booming. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that's partly why this is a nuanced time. So, other sectors that are booming, we have quite a few online education companies. Um, you know, an online education company I'm on the board of grew five and a hex, five and a half X from February to March, right? So um, there are these moments that you can lean into, and that goes against some of the other things that we're saying. The other benefit of this moment for some of those companies is um, huge amounts of the money going into marketing channels have gone away. So all of the travel spend going into those channels has gone away, most of the hospitality spend. And so for some companies that are having really unique moments of unit economics, spending into those channels might make sense because you can see growth at costs that you haven't been able to see recently. So yeah, I think if you're in these unique buckets, um, trying to figure out how to kind of grow into a moment is definitely you know the right thing to do, but I'd be really, Kind of brutal about examining how close you are to that versus how much you want to be in that. Because I think, um, you know, we certainly have other companies that would like to be there and aren't quite there and spending into this moment would be very much the wrong thing in terms of preserving their company. So I just think you have to take a really careful eye to that. It seems like there's also a challenge. I've had this with one or two of my clients. There, there is a, a, a big moment for them, but we don't know how long that moment's going to last. And it seems there's a, a real risk of getting overextended uh, into a situation that that you know it, it could be gone like that. And obviously, I think we probably recognize that some of the shifts we're seeing may persist for some time, but some of them could be over really fast. And I, I think that's that in a sense is a challenge right there. You you want to take advantage of the moment, but how how far do you lean in before you put yourself at risk? It's tricky, you know, there's a there's a number of companies that have, you know, significant tailwinds right now. And there are others that those tailwinds will continue because of the economic crisis that's about to happen. But there's also in that economic crisis, there's headwinds in things like sales. So like software products and things like that, that might in theory be more useful and more important in this in this climate. There may be, you know, pressure around purchasing and things like that. So balancing and, you know, now it's hard to give sort of that feedback across everything, but like that's the sort of nuanced piece of like, what is next? Every week brings us a whole new set of data. And I mean, for pretty much all of our companies, we're, we're monitoring things week to week. All right, uh, question that came in. Uh, if, you, if you're raising a pre-seed round, 
Do you think there is still value in speaking to angels at this time, or mainly to focus on funds? Would funds that say they invest at first check still be interested in pre-seed? Any of you? Um, I mean, I, having been in those shoes, uh, I, I would suggest that all the above. <laughs> like that, you, know, <laughs> you, you got friends, you got, you know, someone you know, and she's got a lot of money, like ask her, uh, it, you know, it's that, that stage is really tough. It's always tough in good times and bad. Um, obviously, in, in, in tough times like now, it's even more difficult. Um, I, I assume the underlying part of the question is like, are angels and uh, who, who tend to be high net worth people um, often do pull back in, in this climate because um, it's their own personal money and, 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 and uh, you know, sometimes they've got other stuff to worry about. Um, so, so that is real. Um, and, you know, if you're a dedicated fund and you're, you're investing in good times and bad, maybe you're not as likely to do that. Um, so, so that's real. But I think pre-seed is pre-seed. It, it takes a lot of hustle. It takes a lot of grit. Uh, I, I would, you know, I'd, I've been through it. You got to ask everyone. And it's, you know, I, I was uh, working on raising money for a company in 2003. And I think we pitched 100, comp 100 people. Um, everyone said no. Uh, and one person said yes, and, and we got it done. Um, but it was it was brutal. Um, it took a lot. And you just you rolled the punches. Don't take no's. Just let it slide off your back. Keep going. And, uh, you know, you, you, have, you have to figure it out. Yeah, it seems a, a, a related factor here is that while funds are still, or many of them, you know, sitting on dry powder uh, for the angel market, uh, people have just seen their net worth diminish dramatically. Uh, and you know, that, that has to impact their, their thoughts as to, as to what type of checks are, they're prepared to write at this point. So. Um, uh, this goes to a related question that a lot of people ask about. Uh, other sources of financing. So for companies that are having trouble raising the VC round right now, is there anything else that you would tell them to be thinking about? I know, John, you said all of the above, and I think that's, that in a sense is the answer, but anything in particular that, that you'd call out or things that you're, you're saying to your portfolio companies? That's not a good sign. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if there's anything else besides all of the above. I think it's the, you know, sort of the hustle and figuring out who the right person, firm, whatever is to to invest in your company. Um, and I would agree it's just gonna in many cases take take longer. I think the other thing you can think about is tranching the amount you wanted to raise. Same, same, same. Say you you know, there's a lot of advice going on around, you know, raise for 18 or 24 months. And obviously that's the ideal situation. But if you can't get there today because it's too early for a lot of funds and, you know, the angels you were counting on have pulled back because of market conditions, can you put your eye on less and try to get there and then, you know, do it in these kind of more bite-sized pieces? Um, that's obviously not the first choice, but I think it's something to think about if it's a you know necessity. But um, I would just you know expand the list: um, individuals, um, groups, angel groups, um, funds, specific funds for the market you're in. I would I would really focus on people who have written checks into similar kinds of businesses as yours. I think it's really not the moment that if you go to someone, an angel or a fund that has you know if you're building a physical e-commerce brand and I think and you go to a firm that you admire but has never invested in a physical e-commerce brand it is probably not the moment that they're going to make their first bet on that space even if you're really fantastic and have a great idea so I would you know expand your list but keep it as focused as you can on people who have some experience with the category that you're working on very good um uh, another question uh, that, that came up, and a couple of you have touched on it, uh, just as a matter of process and logistics, how what's the, how should people be interacting with VCs at this point? How do uh, you know? I mean, traditionally, you, you try to get a 
uh, an introduction by someone, you know, a, a, a VC attorney or uh, someone you know in common or whatever it is. Any thoughts, you know, in, in this time when face-to-face -face meetings aren't happening and uh, communications are a little bit more uh, difficult in terms of how uh, entrepreneurs should manage this process of reaching out to VCs, making those connections and, and pushing their, trying to push the, 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 the raise forward? You know, I, I don't know that that's changed all that month, much um, besides maybe timeline. So I still think, you know, in hierarchy, um, a warm intro, you know, from someone in their portfolio, you can't beat that, right? Next, another entrepreneur that they would admire, you know, further down the list, another investor, you know, further down the list, other service provider. Like I would, I think that, you know, you still kind of tick through the boxes on how warm of a warm intro can you get? And below that is, you know, a really, really killer cold email that, you know, would entice them. I do think you know, all eyes are on email, people are focused. I do think you can get in front of people in new ways, um, you know, engage on Twitter, DM them, um, you know, I think the attention economy has shifted in that way where there may be a moment there. Um, I would just set expectations on the timeline. So if they come back and say, you know, 30 days ago, if they came back and said, hey, great, like, let's talk in three weeks, you might have said, oh, they don't seem that interested, you know. Now I think they might be interested, they're just really focused on some other stuff in the interim. So I would say, okay, um, and just expand your, your timeline and expectation of how long this might take. Um, but, I, but from a process perspective, I think it is probably pretty similar. All right. Um, uh, a question that just came in, if you're raising a round between A and B, would you hire an advisory firm to help raise funds that would require a success fee and a retainer fee? How expensive is the capital now? Any of you? I'll probably speak for everyone. My advice is no, that's a very negative signal. Um, the, the great companies do not have an advisor. At that stage, um, you know, if, if you were raising a hundred million dollar Series D that was a pre IPO round, um, I, I, I would potentially have different advice. Um, but I, I it, and getting you know getting to us is easy. I'm John at Graycroft. Happy to field any and all emails, um, and uh, don't need any intros. Um, obviously, being clever and all, all the advice. Um, Rebecca gave is, is well taken. Uh, you know, if a founder sends sends me a note and says, "Hey, I worked with this person. He's the best person, or she's the best person I've ever worked with," that's going to carry a lot of weight with me. Um, but we're, we're, generally, we're you know, we're all outbound, you know, outward focused people and see a lot of different things. That's our our job, so we're happy to see it. And having a banker involved in that relationship when you're trying to build a relationship with a founder that can last ten years. Or, or longer um it just it's an awkward way to way to start it. it it's a negative signal and and i would avoid it um so i, I won't even get into the fees given given what i'm saying all right so, so we have just a few minutes left uh if the three of you if, if, if you'd each like to any closing thoughts uh and anything else that you think you'd like to to say to 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 these founders I mean, I'd start off by this is a really tough time, both personally for your companies, for your employees, and making time to over communicate to your employees and also take care of yourself throughout this period. Yeah, I think that's go ahead, John. No, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, you know, I, I think I would agree with Beth. I think. Um, Look, I think fear and ambiguity is hard on everyone, no matter what your role is in this whole ecosystem, and everyone is feeling that. And so um, I think, you know, there's acknowledgement we're kind of all in that together. Um, and so, you know, taking care of the people, I think, is the most important thing. I think, you know, the silver lining to me is that if you're starting a business in the in the beginning stages, the journey is long and ahead of you and so the market will recover in the lifetime of your company if you can you know see it through and figure out how to sustain this really rocky time um 
only a better market probably you know let's hope awaits you after after that and many great businesses have come out of those kind of conditions they just press founders to be much more careful about cash and runway than you are in other environments and so um you know that would be what i would be really focused on right now um uh, all great comments um you know i I was born in Berlin in 72 um, and I, you know, it was at the heart, in the heart of the belly of, of a beast of an internet company in, 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 you know, 2001, um, you know, I was in New York on September 11th. Um, I, you know, founded a, a venture fund in 2008 time period. And, you know, what I think about is like, where else would you rather spend your time? I, you know, I have all my investments. I wake up every day. I, I was up till midnight last night working on on on, on one of my portfolio companies and, and planning in this period. And, and I'm sure everyone is is doing the same thing. Um, so I have a great deal of empathy for everyone going through this. Um, but there is a horizon. Um, you know, take care of yourself. Uh, take care of your family. Take care of your employees. Uh, but there's a horizon here and we will get through this and like, like, you know, the concept of like, Hey, I, I could stay in the company and be safe. I think we all would agree it's long gone. Um, you know, you're at, you're all at nimble technology companies. They're trying to figure out the future. Like that's great DNA to have. Uh, and, it, and it's the best place to, to be. And, and that's why I spend all my time, effort and money on, on, on these. And, and and so you're in the right spot. You're doing the right things. We'll get through this. There'll be brighter moments. Um, and and try and keep keep uh, healthy and keep your your thoughts and uh, actions focused on on that. All right. Well, with that, uh, Beth, John, Rebecca, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. At a which is a busy time for you, a busy time for all of us. Uh, Thanks to all the uh, registrants for participating. Uh, please keep your eyes open for the video. We, we did record this. We'll be circulating it and you can pass it on to your colleagues and contacts. Uh, we'll also be sending around a summary of some of the advice that was given. And please do remember if it's within your means to consider a donation to Tech Alliance. Uh, Andy, beyond that, that's all I have. Anything, anything else in closing? No, I think that's everything. Thank you all for participating. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, again, um, we at the New York Tech Alliance are here to support uh, you through this journey. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us however you can. Please stay connected um, as part of our uh, next events. And um, yeah, uh, we are here. Uh, if you want to uh, volunteer or um, you have an idea for a future event, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is andy at nytech.org. Um, and, you know, we're here to create more programming just like this. So thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy, um, and please uh, take some time for yourself. Thank you. Th thank you all. Take care. Andy, thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.